Welcome, everyone, um, to a topic that's close to my own heart, but Jessamyn West has been talking about working on the pieces and moving parts that overlap between libraries, technologies, and politics for 15 plus years. Currently, she works in Orange County, Vermont, as a tech educator slash librarian, where she covers basic tech topics with patrons and teaches digital education classes with adults. Uh, but she's not working as a digital educator and librarian. She's officiating weddings. <laughs> <laughs> and elected justice of the peace in Randolph. Um, and she does talks and presentations like this one um, all across the country, internationally, working towards bridging the, bridging the digital divide while also pushing the discussion forward on what libraries and librarians can do to provide their patrons with the best tech education and access to digital information we can offer. She has edited a book called Revolting Libraries Redux, Radical Librarians Speak Out. She has written a book without a net, Librarians Bridging the Digital Divide. And Jessamyn is here today to talk about protecting your digital privacy. Um, one last thing is we do have webcam covers for people who have laptops or cell phones. I have one on my own laptop. Uh, I have one on mine. So if you're interested at the end and you would like been convinced you would like a webcam cover for your laptop or cell phones, we have some to give out to everyone and without further delay. Justin Wood. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming out on this lovely day. Um, the slides don't have a ton of sort of information on them. Uh, it's mostly just me sort of talking over uh, some various topics. But one of the things is there's a lot of things that I will bring up. Like, oh, and then you can use this plugin or maybe this app or this other thing. So I have sort of a companion website that if you want to follow a link to something, um, if you want to follow a link to something and um, learn more about one particular thing and not something else, uh, the web address is librarian.net slash, this is a little loud, is that better? Is that, is that, can you hear that? Yeah. I don't know, that's good? Okay, great. Um, librarian.net slash talks, T-A-L-K-S, slash privacy17, because that's when I first started giving this talk to libraries. So this page, which has, I'll just, you know, show Can you, you say it quick. again, slash 17? Sure, slash privacy 17. So <coughs> it's up here, librarian.net slash T-A-L-K-S slash privacy 17, all one word and everything is lowercase. But each of the sections, there's a copy of my slides. There's a Google document that has links that you can click and keep yourself. And then each section that I talk about has like four or five links that I think might be helpful on those specific topics. So if one part interests you and the other parts are not so interesting, you can sort of skip through them. But this is live on the internet right now. It works on your phone. You can look at it sort of now or later. But this is Choose Privacy Week at the American Library Association Conference, which is the occasion of, or the American Library Association, which is the occasion of me kind of being down here to begin with. So I'll, I'll mention this web address at the end, but just sort of so you know, and I've been kind of scooting around Vermont talking about sort of internet privacy stuff. The whole sort of idea of this talk in general is people often want to know a little bit more about privacy than they do. People often aren't sure where they should go to learn more about privacy. And a lot of times people get information about privacy either from people who are trying to sell you something or from people who may have uh, knowledge of privacy stuff that's only a little higher than your own which is fun, like we all do the best we can, and I'm certainly not like, and so listen to me and not those other jerks. But what I wanna do is help you kind of figure out how to make those proper decisions for yourself, right? Because I think a lot of us, if you talk to people who are really good with computers, a lot of times they can have uh, very strong opinions on certain things that may not be realistic for your actual life, or you may talk to people who have unfounded opinions that may not be practical for your actual life. 
So what I'm really concerned about is talking about these topics in a general sense, but also trying to help you be able to make the decisions that'll work for whatever your actual life is because you're not me. We are different people. That's great news. But it does mean that maybe what I do in my house isn't something you have to do in your house, or maybe you do need to do something that is different from me. So to start with, there's basically five topics, and also it's a small crowd, so if I say a thing that either doesn't make sense or you just want to know a little bit more about it, feel free to just wave your hand around and I will be happy to answer those questions or at least try to or whatever. Um, don't feel like, oh, this is a big formal room because it sure is not. So getting started, there's five topics and then kind of a before the topics topic. The before the topics topic is, like I said, we're all different people and one of the things that's useful just to kind of keep in your head as you think about all these other topics is the idea of a threat model. And I know it sounds kind of creepy and weird, and I certainly don't need to imply that like, oh God, all this stuff is scary, or you need to worry about it, or all these things are threats. But the important thing is to sort of think about yourself and how important privacy is really depends a little bit on what you're trying to protect. Right? So like, I live in Randolph. 4,500 people, it's a booming metropolis in Orange County, but in the grand scheme of things, it's kind of small. So, but that's me, right? That's not you. Maybe you live right on a main street in Brattleboro. Maybe you live in a big city and you're just visiting here. You have to think about sort of what your own personal situation is. And also, so like what you have to protect, we think of it kind of like actual lock and key. I mean, my car's out there, it's locked. That just seems smart, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't need to. But like I have a partner who's from Massachusetts. He comes and visits me in Vermont. He locks his car in my driveway. It makes me crazy because we come out of the house. Oh, let's toss this in the trunk. Oh wait, I gotta go get the keys, whatever. Again, just different people making different choices for themselves. The other thing about threat models, though, is thinking about not just your physical stuff, but your, in this case, data, right? A lot of what we're talking about is kind of internet threats. So it's kind of like thinking about the front door to your information. So I come from a sort of an activist background, right? And a lot of the people that I know are people who are doing various kinds of activism stuff, and they may want to keep stuff just a little bit more private than the average email user. Maybe they're a little bit afraid of the government, maybe they're trying to protect people's data from other people, maybe they're dealing with people with like uncertain immigration status, or people who are dealing with domestic violence situations, or who knows what the thing is, but they just feel like that's important. Or maybe they're doctors or lawyers who have legal obligations to keep people's information more secure than the average person's. Or maybe they're librarians and there's state laws that affect how private we need to keep you, the patrons, information. So think about yourself a little bit and as you go, think about what your situation is. When I um, work with people at drop-in time, which is my sort of thing I do in Randolph once a week, I hang out, pardon me, I hang out in the room for, I don't know, a couple hours every week and people from the community come in and we work through their technological problems. A lot of people want to know, like, do I need a password on my computer? You know, I'm just, it's at my home. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, you get along with any, everybody you live with? Do you have a child who really wants to mess with your things? You know, do you have an impish teenager who is interested in getting under your skin for some reason? Like, I live alone. I don't have a password on my computer because that's my reality. But I encourage people to think about the stuff because I think we always hear like you can be more secure, you can be more private, you should have more passwords to protect for more things. And while I do think that understanding what a more private situation would look like has utility, so you can kind of figure out where you fall along the bell curve, that doesn't mean you have to implement every single better privacy idea for yourself. In fact, a lot of times people who come in to drop in time, they've got a password on their computer or an Apple ID on their phone. I find that happens a lot. Like a nice family member set it up for them and then we're like, great, let's update your thing. Only they don't know their password. They didn't know they even had a password and now we're just 
swamping dealing with passwords. And so thinking about how many of those hurdles are important for you to put up, are important to put up for someone else you may be helping, and balancing convenience versus privacy against understanding what you have to protect. And so uh, segueing nicely into the password topic, because that's kind of the first thing I like to talk about. So the important thing to know is that passwords are complicated partly because, well, it's important to keep your stuff secure, but partly because people are um, judging what is a password best practice based on often people who are doing something that is more secure than whatever it is you're doing. And I don't know any of you personally, but that's just my guess. And so the idea of a password that like has an uppercase letter and a lowercase letter and a number and a special character and has to be at least eight characters long or whatever, that was like a, seriously like a dude, one guy who, <laughs> was helping the government determine some rules for good passwords for the government and decided, okay, this is gonna be a good sort of heuristic. And then everybody else was like, well, if it's good enough for the government, it's good enough for us. And then you have like, you know, your Tumblr blog or whatever thing that maybe you don't really care about how secure it is, <laughs> requesting an incredibly complicated password because to be fair, that's a safer password. But to be realistic, it's a pain in the neck. And so that list of links I gave you, one of my favorite, probably my favorite link in this whole list of links, is the guy who made that rule for the government has changed his mind <laughs> recently, like in the last year or so, because one of the problems was when you make people make a very complicated password and you make them change it all the time, they write it down. They stick it on their computer. <laughs> they email for password resets all the time and so you wind up with passwords that are only as secure as your email or my favorite example of this was um, Hawaii's been having some really tough weather uh, the last like little while but also they had that big um, sort of North Korea scare where briefly everybody at the University of Hawaii got this alert that was like hey there may be this like incoming you know the uh, bomb situation from North Korea everybody freak out and then like 12 minutes later they got a message that was like don't freak out and part of it was because their um, the software they used, the freak out and don't freak out buttons, were very similar, it was bad software. But one of the things, and then so they interviewed a lot of people from Hawaii. You know, they're on the camera like, well, sorry, uh, yeah. And one of the things people noticed was when you zoom in on those people getting interviewed in front of their computers, there's post-its all over them with passwords on them. So not only are they using software that's not great, that's probably requiring them to have some ridiculous password, but they not only wrote that password down, but then they stuck it to a computer and then they went on network television, right? And I would do the same thing. Like, I don't mean to be like calling these people out, but one of the reasons complicated passwords are less secure is because people don't slash can't slash won't remember them. And so it's worth being okay with yourself if you have passwords that are a little a dippy. Password. Yeah, you know, like name of your pet, name of your kid, name of your kid's pet, name of your kid's birthday, your pet's birthday, your kid's pet's birthday. Like those are probably some of the passwords of people in this room. They gave me password when I got my yeah. computer. Oh, oh. Um, <laughs> I can't, and, and I can't forget that one. And there's tons of stories like that, right? The most common password is password. There's a couple others um, that, that are easy to do on a keypad. Um, ones that spell swears. Numbers that spell swears are some of the most popular uh, ATM pins, which I find sort of interesting. So why are they so complicated? And one of the things that I do talk about with people, a lot of people have been hollered at a lot about not writing down passwords, right? And you know, the anecdote about the nice gentleman from Hawaii does seem to imply that like maybe that's not a good idea. But one of the things I often tell people, especially if you use different passwords for your different things, is that writing them down, especially if they're different, 
is actually a better solution than using one password that you can remember for everything. Don't write them down on a post-it and stick it on the front of your computer, but like most of the people at my drop-in time, they're mostly older than me, but not entirely. Most of them have either something on their computer that remembers passwords, like all the browsers now have a safe password function if you want to use it. There's the keychain within the Apple environment. There's um, software like KeyPass and OnePass. Both of them are linked on the list of links. If you use one computer regularly, having the computer remember your password is good. But a lot of them just have a little notebook. And the little notebook just has like New York Times login. Because sometimes you can't remember. Is my login my email or do I have a login name? Like I'm lucky that my first name is Jessamine. So a lot of times my login to things can be Jessamine because it's unique enough. But if my name was Jennifer, my login would be like Jennifer1234. That's taken. Jennifer2345. That's taken. <laughs> Jennifer, I'm super sick of this, or whatever. And a lot of times it's hard to even remember what your login is. And then if you keep that as secure as you keep your wallet in your purse or your backpack, it's actually pretty secure. People are still going to holler at you about writing down your passwords, but it's more secure than other choices. And that's really going to be the message for today. Like, more secure than the alternative is better for you. Perfect privacy is never getting on the internet, living in a house on the side of the mountain, and never answering the door, right? And maybe that's your dream, in which case, go you. But if it isn't, we'll just try and get a little bit more private, not, oh my gosh, everything. So password managers, I find, are helpful, especially if you don't use a lot of different computers. And the other sort of thing I mentioned, and I'm not going to get too into it because I feel like it gets in the weeds, but a lot of the major like social software websites, for example, or all the major email programs will do a thing that's called two-factor authentication. Your bank may do this. And what it means is you log in with a password, and then you got to do another thing. Whether it's get a text on your phone. I'm pointing to my pocket. I don't know where my phone is. You get a text on your phone, or maybe you have to get a number from a number generator on your phone or maybe they call you, or you have to do a second thing. Maybe you have to answer a challenge question. Those are good. And that's two-factor, meaning it's a lot less likely that the person who can get through both of those hurdles is not you. Now, the downside is if you have two-factor authentication and it relies on you getting a text on your phone and you're in rural Vermont, you may find that that's difficult. A lot of people uh, that come to drop-in time have like two-factor authentication on their bank account, but they get a phone call at their home, which is great if they're at home, right. but less great if they're not at home. And the greatest thing about drop-in time is it's kind of in a concrete bunker. And so depending on where you are in the building, you may have no cell signal at all, like some people do and some people don't. So occasionally when I'm helping somebody and they need to get a text back, um, be like, okay, you got a text. Go to the parking lot, <laughs> get your text, come back, and then we'll do the next step. But if you're concerned about keeping things secure, two-factor authentication is useful with certain caveats. The other thing is a lot of those challenge questions are bad, and that's not you, that's bad questions, right? Now, I don't know about you, but like when somebody asks me a question like, hey, what's your favorite movie? I'm like, what, now? How about now? Like, I don't know, Black Panther I saw was pretty good, but like did, when I answered the question originally for the bank, I don't know what my favorite movie is. I try to steer away from favorite movie or favorite whatever, who's your best friend? Like, that's always hard, right? <laughs> like, did I say my boyfriend? Did I say my sister? Did I say my other friend? Like, I try to stick to like, you know, where did you live in third grade or something that's relevant to me. But don't feel weird if you look at a lot of those questions and think, these are stupid, I thought my bank was smart. Because a lot of times all they're really doing is taking software off the shelf too do this kind of stuff. So highly recommend two-factor authentication. Practice with it a little bit, though, when you're somewhere 
secure so that you know how it works because it's real bad to get like locked out of your email because you thought you could get a text on your phone and then it turns out you don't have service at the place you were trying to go. But that's what two-factor authentication means, basically a secondary challenge. It's definitely more secure. It also means if for some reason somebody has your password, they don't have access to your things. This is why the bank more and more requires it and this is why a lot of social software especially encourages it because they want you to be able to mess around with your things but they don't want to spend all their time dealing with arguments with people saying I was hacked I mean you still see people doing it there was a very kind of prominent um, newscaster recently who somebody found something on her blog from eight years ago that was like you said something crummy eight years ago which the world we live in and she was like I was hacked and other people are like no you weren't like that but at any rate you don't want to be those people so this is a thing you can do and so thinking about easier to remember passwords I'm gonna try and use this yes I have literally never used a laser pointer before in my life this is a very exciting day for me so this is a comic strip which is also linked on the list of links it's a comic strip for nerds so it's called xkcd i don't even remember why but basically they like to talk about tech issues and so this long dumb password has you know all the stuff you're supposed to have right it's a word that's complicated and then you put like letters for numbers like a three for an e or a zero for an o whatever and so then this explains it's sort of hand wavy math a computer could guess that in about three days if it was guessing a guess every you know a thousand guesses a second so it's easy to guess in computer terms don't worry about it if this is a password of yours but <laughs> and then how hard is it for you to remember it's hard it stinks you can't remember it it's irritating was that a three for an e or an o for a zero i have no idea but if you take four words and just put them together because a computer is just a calculator right your human eyeballs can look at these and say those are four words of english a computer can't splice that into words of english as easy as your eyes can and it's actually super complicated for a computer to guess and it's actually a lot easier for you to remember now part of the problem is a website may not let you use correct horse battery staple but if it does it's actually a better password so if you're protecting something like on your computer where it doesn't require you to have a special kind of password or whatever something like that is easier and of course the joke is 20 years everybody uses passwords that are super hard for human beings and super easy for computers to guess <laughs> Ugh, ridiculous whoops so passwords that's my sort of general thing if you have questions about passwords now or afterwards feel free to ask the next thing when you think about how to be a little bit more private is think about when you're using the internet how much can other people sort of see of what you're doing so one of the things that's worth a mention is every major internet browser so that's safari firefox chrome internet explorer slash edge depending on what you're using has a function may have a slightly different name but it's called private browsing so as it is right now if i sit down at a computer and i open it up and let's say i'm using the library's internet and i you know go to my email and then i go to some other page the, um, the computer that is providing the internet service can have, kind of knows where I've been a little bit. It's a, a little hand wavy because no one wants to get super deep in the weeds here. But you can see kind of where, if I hit the library's website, theoretically the library could know what page I was on before the library's website. It's called a referral link. This helps the library or whoever's internet page it is kind of know where people are coming from what links they're clicking that kind of stuff this is a normal way the internet works that said maybe that's not something you want or maybe you want to not have the places that you've been to on a computer that you're sitting at 
have any record at all on a machine. So you've all like sat down at your computer and been like, what was that page I was reading on the New York Times like six days ago? And you're like, I don't remember, it had something to do with turtles. And you type turtles up in the sort of address bar and then there comes the article because your computer keeps track of where you've been. Now this is helpful for you personally, probably, if you want to look something up. It also is leaving a little track of where you've been on the computer you're on. Now with the library computers, you guys can tell me, when somebody like gets up from a library computer, does it sort of reset and start over? Yes. Yeah, so the good news is, people at this library know what they are doing. Nice work. <laughs> and so as a result, you step up from the computer and somebody else sits down and it starts a whole new session and all the places that you've been go away. But if you're sharing a computer at home, if you're using a friend's computer, if you're using a public computer in a library maybe who doesn't quite know as much what they're doing, like you may sit down and type in, you know, mail.yahoo.com or Gmail, and somebody else's email comes up if maybe they haven't logged themselves out, or maybe they haven't, you know, maybe this sort of session didn't change over. And so you can use private browsing to make sure the computer isn't keeping track of where you've been. Very helpful. The one thing that I will mention about private browsing though is it will also any customization, like, you know, my eyesight isn't what it used to be. So when I sometimes go to websites that let me make the typeface a little bigger, I do. And I enjoy that very much. It's like a little bit bigger. What that website is doing is it's setting a little what we call a cookie. You've probably heard the term cookie over and over again. Like on the one hand, tantalizing. On the other hand, everyone's like, they are terrible. And most people are like, I don't know what they are. It's very confusing. So if you, know, you go to NewYorkTimes.com and you say, I really want the typeface to be a little bit bigger, the New York Times puts a tiny piece of, like a text, tiny text file on your computer that's like, when this user comes to use the computer, make the text a little bit bigger because that's what she likes. And it's, sometimes it's on the computer, sometimes it's attached to your account, and that's a cookie, a tiny text file with a little bit of information. Private browsing keeps everything from being attached to the computer, but what that can mean is customizations, hanging onto your logins, hanging onto preferences that you've set up, won't necessarily work. And if you want to figure out that article on turtles from five days ago that you read in the New York Times, tough. So it does come at a cost, but it does mean that when you get up from that computer, there's no record of what you've looked up on that computer, what you've typed, what you've done. So again, assess your threat model, think about how you feel, that is a thing that you can use that's available to anybody who has an internet browser that they can use. The other thing a lot of people ask about is, uh, well, public Wi-Fi, because security experts tell you basically don't ever use it for any reason, and then most people are using it all the time for tons of reasons, and so trying to figure out where, where you fall along those lines. It is true that when you're hanging out, using your laptop in, I was just at Amy's, the little coffee shop down the way. They've got public Wi-Fi, a little password typed in. When I'm using their Wi-Fi, the stuff that I'm typing in does get transmitted through the air, um, often as just plain old text. And somebody could, if they were a hardened criminal hacker or just a kid who wants to mess around, now, this is a, outside of my level, like I can't do this. I don't know how to do this, but it's doable. Could like, kind of, they call it sniffing, which I think is sort of weird, but like they could technically capture that traffic that's going through the air and know some things. Now we'll talk a little bit about how some of that traffic is gonna be encrypted. So, not that traffic, but like, you know, if I send, I don't know, some message that I type into a web form that isn't like a bank or a doctor or whatever, could just go through the air. Now, I mostly don't care because I mostly feel like I am mostly safe in most places in Vermont, let's say. But if I was using some random internet, some random coffee shop in some random giant city, I might think a little bit about how much I wanted to send over a public 
wireless network or airports. Airports are an, actually a great suggest a great idea because a lot of times, like if you go to Burlington, Vermont, right? You open up your laptop. There's like BBT free Wi-Fi, but depending, sometimes there's other wireless networks that have very similar sounding names, and you're not a hundred percent sure which one is the actual airport one, especially because it's changed a couple times. And airports are kind of notorious for having a lot of kind of free-floating ne'er-do-wells <laughs> who just like to kind of mess around. Now, me personally, it's kind of a don't care situation, but because I'm not doing any, I'm doing a lot of boring email. But if you're somebody who needs to do an important thing that involves your private nonsense, airport Wi-Fi, not really a good choice. Library Wi-Fi, a little bit better because they keep things slightly more secure, but it is worth sort of understanding. Public Wi-Fi really is, in a lot of ways, public. And so it's worth thinking about. Especially, and back to passwords briefly, a lot of times when I talk about sort of my own thing, I have like a really short, dumb password that isn't a word of English, but is not very long and not very complicated that I use for most things I don't care about. But for my bank, and for my doctor's electronic portal thing, whatever the heck it is, my medical stuff, I have long, complicated passwords. And I often tell people, if you're doing like online banking, you probably want to be even more careful only because banking, right? It's important. It's your money. It's your things. Realistically speaking, if somebody for some reason acquired one of your debit cards and used it to uh, buy a bunch of telecommunications services in Barbados, as happened to my partner last week. It's only an inconvenience, like you're not liable for that other person's money, but it's a total pain in the neck. So it's worth, you know, maintaining security, but also being like the worst case scenario is irritating, but identity theft level stuff is unusual. It does happen, but it is unusual. And so, if you're trying to figure out, is the stuff I'm sending over public Wi-Fi secure? You, know, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we all know, I think, a web address starts with HTTP colon slash slash. That just stands for Hypertext Telnet Protocol. You don't care and it doesn't matter. But one of the things that the internet has been starting to do, like the sort of normal internet that like everyday people use, not just secure internet that nerds use, is sending more and more traffic using HTTPS. It's just a slightly different way of sending information. The S stands for secure. So what that means is, and again, slightly hand wavy, but if you send a thing, over the internet, you're logged into a website and the web address is HTTPS colon slash slash your bank name. That means the information that you send over the internet is encrypted end to end. So even if somebody were sniffing your traffic, they would get garbage, not your plain text information. Now I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but not a ton. But if this is a thing that is interesting to you, it is worth kind of keeping an eye on the web addresses of the pages you visit, because now all the major email providers, web-based email providers use HTTPS. Every bank uses it. And more and more pages that require a login have HTTPS. And the ones that don't, often you're going to notice that your web browser may warn you if you try to type a thing into a form that's not using HTTPS. And you may wonder, like, what is going on? Like, if you go to, I think my library website was like this. Uh, Kimball Library is my library in Randolph. And I would log in to, you know, my library account, and my browser would be like, hey, your library login isn't secure. And I'd be like, that's cool. I don't really care if somebody hacks my library account. But the browser would kind of nag you, which is actually kind of an affirmative security choice that the people who make the browsers decided on. However, that said, let's say you have a job where you have to log in all the time to some website that nags you every single time. There are actually ways to turn that nagging thing off. It's on the list of links, but if you're in a place where you have to log in all the time, like when I work at the library, I don't want to see that error message like 75 times a day. 
So I have turned it off. So it's a turn offable thing, but it's there for your safety. If you are somebody who really cares that you're like, I travel a lot, and as well, I need to log on to a lot of websites and make sure I'm absolutely secure, two three-letter acronyms that are maybe helpful for you. One of them is VPN, which is called a virtual private network. Sometimes if you're like a banker and you need to do your connection to your work bank using the internet, they can make you a connection, which is like some settings you change in your computer, so that you can have a direct, always secure, one-to-one -one connection to that bank. So there are ways to connect securely, it just requires you know, the person who's running the server that you need to log into to kind of make a deal with you. VPN services, uh, services can be purchased. Um, it's a little kind of 200 level, 300 level privacy, so don't think about it too much for yourself, but if somebody says like, oh, I got a VPN, you can be like, oh, you connect securely to this other place. Or, let's say you really like to watch BBC television shows and they are free at bbc.govcom or whatever the BBC is, but you try to see them from home and they say, hey, you don't live in the UK so you don't get to watch these things. If you wanted to pretend that you live in the United <laughs> Kingdom, you could technically get a VPN, this is like a service you would pay for, where you could directly connect to a computer in the UK and it would make it seem like you lived in the United Kingdom. People from Canada have this problem a lot because they want to watch Comedy Central content on the internet and they can't because they live in Canada and geographic borders are super weird when dealing with the internet, but sometimes you might know somebody who's like, oh yeah, I've got a VPN so I can watch soccer, and you're like, this makes no sense to me. I thought it was for bankers, but it's also for enthusiasts of television in other countries. Jess, there is another disadvantage for VPNs is that wow. certain websites, or, or like for instance, uh, I think Netflix gets a little funky on VPNs. Oh, is that true? Yeah, Hulu doesn't allow you to watch a VPN anymore. So. Well, and you know why Hulu doesn't do that? For exactly this reason. Yeah, there's two big downsides to VPN. is streaming services a lot of times because of how the packets are sent um, can it either refuse or not work well. And it's a little slower because it's sending every packet securely, not just your password and your login. So certain things don't work well at all. I, I use ExpressVPN, and not uh -huh. only was it like completely user friendly, um, like I just click a button, literally, um, it it's not slower at all. It's oh, perfect! Really, really fast. So they're getting a lot better. She uses ExpressVPN, <laughs> which I've never. I used one briefly during the. I can't remember. I think it was like sixty dollars for a year because I travel a lot. Yeah. yeah. I used one called Tunnel Bear when I wanted to watch the Olympics, not this Olympics, but last Olympics, and I needed to pretend I was in some other, I think Canada, because I wanted to watch a lot of curling, and I could only watch a little curling. Um, but yeah, there, there are a couple, and it sounds complicated, and it sounds like programming, and it literally is clicking, pointing, and getting stuff set up. Most of the stuff I'm talking about is you can do it by, if you know how to install software, or click buttons, it is within your ability. None of this involves coding, I promise. And supposedly, if, if you're concerned about your privacy in terms of your internet service provider, I presume a VPN would prevent them from seeing anything you do. Yeah, because Comcast gives packets, so I always use a VPN at my Comcast Xfinity connection. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting, I, I noticed this happening because I was just traveling this weekend, I did a search for something in my browser, and instead of, um, or I typed a word into my browser, and at home, what happens is it just searches Google for me, or DuckDuckGo is what I use. And instead, I got this web page back from Verizon, who was the internet service provider of the house that I was at, who basically set it up so that if you do a search in your browser, it'll go through Verizon's own search because they're your internet service provider and they can just change what you see on the internet. I found it super irritating. Like, I know how to turn it off, but your internet service provider can easily know what you're doing. And even though it's totally outside of the scope to start talking about net neutrality and a whole bunch of that other stuff, it is worth thinking that if you're concerned about your internet service provider for reasons, VPNs can also keep your traffic 
So you can use them to connect to the internet, but then you don't have to use them to be the people who serve your web page. And they've gotten a lot faster, a lot more user friendly. Nice. And they're a lot, yeah, because I had to like change a bunch of settings with Tunnel Bear. And no, it was, it's, it's literally just click, click, click go after you download the program. Love it. Love it. That's Good to know. Yeah. yeah. It's on my phone too. And then the other option, so a VPN is a thing you do for your own computer, and then Tor is both a kind of a almost like a secondary internet network of computers that all connect to each other, but Tor is also the name of an internet browser that is privacy on by default. So maybe you're like, private browsing, I don't know, or I'm working somewhere where I can't change the browser at all. You can put Tor on a thumb drive, and if you can access a thumb drive from a computer you're using, you can run a browser that is absolutely secure and makes use of kind of an alternative network of internet sites to send your traffic around. There's been a lot of talk in the media, I don't know, last year or two, I guess, of libraries, especially, I guess, the one in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Is there another one in Vermont, New Hampshire area? Maybe not. I know around here. But like libraries who are becoming nodes on that sort of secondary network of traffic. And it's one of those things, again, a little too complicated for getting super into, but enables you to be absolutely private on the internet, which is great news if you're trying to overthrow your tyrannical government, but it's also great news if you want to buy heroin on the internet. So there's like a good news, bad news situation here. And I am not your ethicist. <laughs> but if you are a person who has decided you need that level of privacy, it is actually available to you. And at our library, at Kimball, we just offer the Tor browser as an alternative browser you could use in addition to Firefox or Internet Explorer. It's just... Uh, can, can you uh, articulate the difference between using the Tor browser and using the private browse on a, a traditional browser. Tor browser has all the same privacy settings as private browsing, but it sends traffic through its own private, it's like its own, again, a little hand wavy, but it's like it's using its own private network of traffic. Tor browser is definitely a little slower, but it is 100% secure. And I mean, there are arguments among nerds about whether that's 100% or 100% with some government backdoor, but I'm fairly certain if you are somebody who needs to keep your stuff secure, Tor, T-O-R, and there's links to Tor information and what it is, more about it, it is a good thing to think about. How does Tor differ from, Duck, from DuckDuckGo? DuckDuckGo is just a search engine. So what? Yeah, DuckDuckGo doesn't keep your search history the way Google does, and it doesn't track you through the internet. We'll talk a little bit about tracking coming up, but it doesn't have any kind of network of internet infrastructure. Whereas Tor is both, and this is why it's confusing, it's a browser, but also an internet infrastructure that underlies it, which enables traffic to not touch the kind of normal internet the rest of the time. And they're both really interesting. So this is just... That's what the S looks like. <laughs> and um, we'll talk a little bit more. There's a, um, a browser plugin that you can use that I like, which is called HTTPS Everywhere, listed on that list of links, which will, if a website has a secure version, it will get that secure version even if what you typed in or the link you tried to follow was not a secure version. But we'll talk a little bit about browser plugins coming up. So these things, these internet assistants, these female voiced robots that live in your house, yeah? Yeah, so I just bought one of these. Um, it it uh, plays DVDs, but it's also, it, it's very cheap. It's $79 at, at Walmart. It's also a, um, you know, a, a sort, of, sort of like a, a laptop and it's a plastic thing. And so I'm not using the, um, I don't want to pay for Xfinity or whatever, the 30 extra bucks a month. Sure. So I'm just using it to look at DVDs. So I have it there one day, and it says, listening. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I don't know what that thing is. Or what is listening? I don't know what that specific thing is, but here's the interesting thing about these, um, I don't know what they call them, like assistants or whatever. Mm -hmm. So like my phone, for example, I use a lot of times, I'll use speech to text, and I talk to it, and it can transcribe what I say. A lot of people use you know, Siri, Alexa, I don't even know what the other things are on the other phones, to like ask questions and it'll send things to the internet. So my phone, when I'm doing dictation, isn't connecting to the internet because I made sure it isn't, because I don't want it to. So it does have some transcription stuff on, just on the phone itself, so that it is both listening, but not giving my stuff to anyone else. My guess is your device has some voice commands built into it so that if, it, does it have a name? Um, it's an RCA thing and it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's both, you can play DVDs on it, it, it opens up like this, yeah. or like that, I mean, yeah. and you can play DVDs on it, it's a plastic thing, it's about this big. And you can also use it as a computer, but I don't do that because I, I, I don't want to bother with the... the right. So, and plus I use the computer here. Uh, and Smart. it's a freebie. <laughs> but so the thing is, there are voice, but I didn't, I didn't ask for it. I didn't, and well, there it is, a all very, of a sudden listening. <laughs> that's a very interesting thing about consent, right? A lot of these devices that are supposed to be helping you believe that I mean, they really, literally, I believe, believe in their heart of hearts that by listening for you to activate them or request a thing or whatever, that's what you want and they are helping you. My guess is that is turn offable, again, without knowing what the thing is. Right. But the important thing, and I love my little book, all of the like smart TV, smart microwave, smart refrigerator that tells you when it's out of eggs, really have we gotten to that point? Like I'm a little, in general, I'm very much value neutral. Like use whatever you want, it's awesome. And then I'm like, really? Your refrigerator needs to tell you you're out of eggs. That said, I'm out of eggs, so maybe I could have used this, right? I literally went to make latkes and it needed two eggs and I had one and I was just like, so, the first thing to know, and I know this sounds a little bit basic, but it's really worth repeating. If your device is not online, and yours is not, because you know, because you did not pay for internet and you do not have it, although you should check to make sure it doesn't connect to your neighbor's Wi-Fi, depending on where you live. If it is not online, it cannot spy on you, meaning it won't send your information somewhere else. Which is useful to know, because there are a lot of people who are like, you know, I just wanted a TV, but all the TVs are internet TVs. How do I make my internet TV not talk to other people, right? So the most important thing is making sure if you care, and again, maybe you don't care, and that's a completely reasonable grown-up choice. Make sure it can't get on the internet. So make sure it's not connecting to your home internet. If you have home internet that's just kind of joinable, sometimes one of the things that's easy is just to put a password on your home internet so that smart devices can't join it automatically. Um, they'll request you want to do that. Um, anything that is listening for your voice, my phone, if I didn't, or, sir? Yeah, I got a question. So if you've got, I guess they call them smart TVs now that connect to your internet, to your Wi-Fi. Yeah. If you didn't want that to happen, but you still want to be able to use Netflix and all that on the TV, can should you could you get a um, <clears throat> what if you got like an Amazon sticker, one of those sticks that you, Google whatever they call it. Those like a Roku sticker, a yeah. I think Fire Stick or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Those things connect to the internet as part of their thing. They can't hear you. But they can't listen to you, and so that's useful. Depending well, on the model. Depending on the model. Right, yeah, right. If you, if you get a model that doesn't have any microphone and you disconnect the TV from it, at least from that end, you're disconnecting that. Of course, yeah. and a lot of other things in your house that could be doing the problem. Yeah, a lot of the things that have voice commands, the voice commands are turned on but are also turned offable. Right. So, like, for instance, my phone, if I didn't tell it not to, I could, like, say, hey, Siri, and I have it turned off, otherwise you hear my phone in my bag being like, boop, you know, hi. And it listens for you to say, hey, Siri, 
which means it listens for you to say anything to then determine if you're saying hey Siri or not. And theoretically, if you listen to Apple, it's only listening kind of in a loop and it throws away the stuff that isn't hey Siri as soon as it finds out you're not trying to get its attention. If you are privacy conscious, you might not believe them. And that wouldn't necessarily be a bad choice. Like, I trust Apple in general. I don't know if I trust them in specific. And I don't like the idea that my device could start listening to me by, or people that come into my house, right? Like, maybe I like the convenience of Hey Siri, but maybe my guests did not agree to be recorded by Apple. And so I've turned it off, but I had to go in and turn it off, which irritates me. Because by default, Apple would really like it to be on. Now, a lot of this stuff, in order to figure out how it works for your specific device, it's usually a, I used to say Googleable, but now I use DuckDuckGo for most, most of my searching. So it's a DuckDuckGoable. It doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> it's a DuckDuckGoable thing. Like, turn off listening for my for my, you know, Amazon Echo, for my Amazon Dot, for my whatever the thing Android is, phone. Android phone, for my iPhone, for my iPad, for my Fire Stick, for my Roku, almost all of the ones that I know of, I think every single one that I know of, you can turn off the listening aspect unless it's literally the only thing that device does. You know, like a baby monitor. You turn off the listening aspect of a baby <laughs> monitor and you have nothing. But most things you can do that. Yes? Paul? Yeah, so I just wanted to mention this. So one time I turn on my phone and it's got the uh, the video camera is pointing at me and there I am. What the is that all about? <laughs> These questions are getting more and more complicated, but <laughs> probably, you know, like on my phone, if I am holding my phone in my hand and it's locked but I swipe this way, the way my phone is set up, the camera turns on. Because it's supposed to be convenient for me to be like, oh look, a moose, you know. <laughs> Very important, right? But maybe that's not, and if I have, and if I, if I happen to be holding it and I touch my finger in the corner, which is where the camera flip thing is, suddenly I am looking at a picture of myself, which I rarely want to be doing in, you know, in that instance. So probably it's an odd series of things, but it is worth knowing. And on the iPhone and on the Android phone, you can go into your settings and see what things have permission to use your camera and to use your microphone. Because like, for instance, if you use Skype on your phone, you have to tell it, it's okay to use the microphone, it's okay to use the camera, but once you tell it it's okay, it just keeps it being okay. You may have to go in and turn that off. Or you can get the little stickums that go over your camera on your thing. So even if you turn it on by accident, you know for a fact it's not recording anything because you put, I mean, if you don't want to use the library stickums, like post-its work pretty well. <laughs> And then what happens, of course, because I'm the absent-minded professor, is I sit down for my Skype interview or whatever, and I'm like, what's going on with my computer? Everything's broken. Oh, right, I've got a stick on my camera. Hi. But it is, you know, all computers, basically almost every modern computer has a camera. Almost every modern computer has a microphone. On your phones, it's a little bit more granular about turning it on and off. On these devices, they have no settings. So a lot of times you have to go into a website in order to change those settings. Mm -hmm. And with a, you know, with a TV or with a microwave or with a refrigerator that's out of eggs, once they're connected to the internet, mm -hmm. you have less of an ability to sort of dictate how they do things. But you can not connect your refrigerator <coughs> to the internet to begin with. Or if you change your home Wi-Fi password, guaranteed your refrigerator can't pick up your new password so if you're worried about what in my house currently has the ability to connect to the internet, you can just change your home Wi-Fi password and then you'll see what fails, basically. <laughs> so anything that's listening for your voice is literally paying attention kind of all the time. And there have been these funny jokes about like people that do YouTube videos that would be like, I don't even know what, how you get in touch with the Amazon thing. Like, hey Alexa or Alexa, they all have weird lady, no lady names. Um, but you, there'd be YouTube videos where people would just be like, hey Siri, and then like you'd be sitting watching a YouTube video and suddenly your phone goes beep beep, like what? 
because they're not that smart, actually. The word smart has really been stretched to turn into just some nonsense, right? Because they don't even know it's you for the most part. They just answer anybody that says the secret passwords, the, the special words, or whatever the thing is. So thinking about what's online, what's recording you, and thinking and reading very carefully when you first take the thing out of the box, <coughs> or whatever the terms of service are, or sometimes we call this a EULA, End User Licensing Agreement, E-U-L-A. So like Samsung, for instance. Samsung was notorious for having like, I don't remember what it was, like they had the phone that caught on fire, I think they had a vacuum cleaner that caught on fire. Um, they were having a bad year. They had some other bad thing that happened, whereas everybody was like, oh, Samsung. But, one of the things that's interesting is if you read their terms of service, and I don't have a Samsung anything, so I kind of pulled this off the internet, but one of the things that's interesting, well, one <laughs> of the things that's interesting is it's not just that your TV is listening to you, but your TV, again, is kind of a dumb robot. It sends your voice away to be processed somewhere else at some not Samsung company. Like maybe you're like, well, Samsung's a good brand and I trust them and nothing's caught on fire this year, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. But you don't even know who they are sending their stuff away to. And again, I don't mean to be like, so anybody who uses a smart device is an idiot. I just mean there's third parties that are also going to get your information and so it is worth thinking that through when you're in a room with a device that is listening or when you and your friends are discussing something and these are turn offable all the devices are turn offable but it is important to understand that your information if you're like and then we overthrow the tyrannical government is going somewhere else and the other thing which is a little bit more kind of obvious is security cameras you guys have security cameras here yeah, I think the only library that I know in Vermont that has one is Fletcher, and they just kind of have them like outside the bathrooms. I'm not even sure if they're on. I think they're mostly just to be like, please don't destroy the bathroom. Like, it's everybody's bathroom. Don't. But security cameras are interesting because they don't really prevent crime. They help a little bit to make people feel safer, and sometimes they help make crimes easier to solve. So like I'm like a TV cop show nerd, but I won't watch like American TV cop shows because they are violent. So I watch like British cop shows because they don't have any guns. And you know, I watch this one called Scott and Bailey, which is like these lady cops. It's, it's like as if it were a cop show, but like all the dudes were played by ladies and all the ladies were played by dudes. So there's these ladies and they solve crimes, but it's in the UK and the UK has a ton of video cameras just everywhere, right? All the roads, all the cities, and the number of crimes they solve, at least partially, because, you know, something happens, and they're like, oh, let's get the footage. That even though I really like this cop show, I do sometimes wonder if it's just an advertisement for security cameras, <laughs> because they solve so many crimes with security camera footage. But you'll notice, because it's a cop show, nobody's not getting stabbed. They're just maybe finding the person who did the stabbing, maybe. And one of the things that's interesting about cameras in libraries, uh, I went to a library in Massachusetts that not only had cameras, but had a big warning on the door, like, if you walk through here, we have cameras. And I'm a civil libertarian, and so I was a little crabby about this. And, and then they had a sign underneath that was like, everyone is welcome here. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't feel welcome. You know, I'm huffy about these things. But I'm, again, the world is not all people like me, and I sort of mentioned this on social media, and I was surprised how many people got back to me being like, you know, I actually feel a little safer with cameras around because I feel like if I wander off into the darkened stacks on my own, some creep's not going to follow me down there because they know they're visible on a camera. There was a lot of women who got back to me who were like, they actually make me feel more welcome, not less welcome. I was like, all right, good. Good to know. There are these, I mean, the best thing I think I got out of the Obama administration was like, these are things on which reasonable people can disagree. So you have to think about your particular threat model and how you particularly feel. There's reasons for security cameras, reasons not to have them. But think about your televisions and computers and things that might have cameras on them. 
how you feel about them and realize that you can basically stop your own personal cameras from recording you by putting a sticky over them and they work. And there's a lot of sort of more conspiracy minded than myself people who feel like you should cover every camera at all times constantly. You can think about how, or like, you know, on my laptop, there's a green light that goes on when the camera goes on. I'm comfortable with that. Other people are like, or does it? You know, like, can there be other, what if, what if someone was spying in you and the light didn't come on? And again, I have to go back to my threat model. Like, when I was a kid, I was really afraid of being kidnapped because who knows, right? I lived in a tiny town and my mother, who had to deal with me being like, ooh, worried, was like, sweetheart, we're not important enough for you to be kidnapped. <laughs> like, like, it's okay, I understand that you're worried, and you know, that's a real feeling, but no one wants to kidnap you. Like, and I just had to go back to my threat model and be like, all right, I may worry about it, but I don't think given my threat model, anybody's after me. If I changed how I interacted with the world, you know, I think of the Edward Snowdens of the world, they would do things differently. I am not <laughs> that person, and I don't need to make my life as inconvenient as his life is, right? Um, so, thinking a little bit about tracking. We mentioned this before, um, like DuckDuckGo is the search engine that doesn't track you. So that's okay, but what is that, like what, is, what does it mean that a search engine tracks you, right? One of the things that's been really interesting lately, especially in the wake of all this like Facebook nonsense, which I am not going to get into, um, is people thinking like, well what data does Facebook have about me? Or what data does Google have about me? And what you may not know is that both Google and Facebook allow you to get access to the data they have that you have given them affirmatively. So like every post you've made on Facebook, every like you've made, every friend relationship you've made, there is actually a way to download all your Facebook data. Don't recommend it. It'll cause a lot of soul searching about what you're doing with your life and <laughs> but you can so that you can see what they have but they also have a lot of relational information about you like what time you're awake and what time you're asleep and what devices you use to connect to Facebook and so with Google because Google owns many other web properties they're a search engine they're a mapping thing in your Android phone. They're everything. They're the operating system. They are YouTube. They are, what else is Google on that's like big? Drive? What's yeah, they're, they're your file storage. What's they're, that? Do they own WhatsApp now? That's Facebook. Oh, no, that's Facebook. <laughs> so complicated, these toxic mega corporations. But basically, they can, because Google owns all those things, they can connect that information to itself. Google also has a thing called Google Takeout. If you're interested in what information Google has about you, you can go to Google Takeout. I'm pretty sure it's on that list of links. If not, duck, duck, go Google Takeout and you'll be fine. That would make a great password, right? All those words strung together, very secure. You can sort of see what they know about you. I think about tracking a little bit more when I think about advertising. So I um, was using uh, website to like look up, um, I was looking for like luggage, right? I travel a lot, I was looking for like a good bag because I'm always shopping for a better bag than the one I have. And so I was looking for bags and I, there was this one bag that I was kind of interested in. It was like some New York Jets roller bag and it was really cheap because the Jets are not a very good team, right? <laughs> Sorry if they're your team. They're not very good at whatever sport they play. Football? Football? Um, but it was like a really cheap roller bag and it looked like it was going to be great. So I was like, all right, I'll think about that for later. And then I started browsing the internet like you do and who knows what's going on. And I was reading, I don't know, the Atlantic or the New York Times, something. And there was a little ad down in the corner from eBags being like, hey man, that New York Jets, what do you think? I was like, how did they know? And of course they know because eBags puts a cookie on my computer. That cookie has some individual code that links to one unique bag. And then when I go to the New York Times, they subscribe to the same advertiser that eBags uses. They can read that cookie, which is called a third party cookie, and serve me a picture of that bag to be like, hey dummy, you forgot to buy this. But I like that as an example because it's a pretty clear, like, it's just a tiny piece of text. Nobody's watching you or listening to you, but because 
eBag stored that tiny piece of text, and the New York Times and eBag both use one advertising agency, and there's only four advertising agencies on the internet, basically, and one of them is Google. Incidentally, that's their job. Like, Google's actual job is they're the biggest advertising agency on the planet. Like, they do a lot of other stuff, and I use them all the time, too. I don't mean to be like, don't use them, but a lot of people kind of don't think about, like, they're actually a giant advertising concern, not necessarily just, um, you know, a search engine, a mapping thing, a YouTube, the Android thing, et cetera. So, thinking about tracking, betting, being tracked, you can actually use a lot of plugins for your browsers. And plugins sounds like math. And it's literally clicking. Like clicking once to install the thing, clicking again when the browser's like, did you want to install the thing? And you're like, that's what I said. And then you can have add-ons like. Um, these are three that I recommend. These are all listed in the list of links. ACPS Everywhere, I talked about already. It basically serves a secure website. My favorite, and it's not without its downsides, but my favorite is this one called Adblock Pro Plus? Plus. Plus, thank you. Adblock Plus, which basically you plug it in, it runs in your browser, your browser loads a web page, Adblock Plus keeps all the ads from your eyeballs. Now, this is a good news, bad news thing, right? because many websites that you probably love depend on advertising in order to be able to stay in business. Other websites that you may or may not love won't load if they see that you're running an ad blocker because a web page that you load can tell what browser plugins you're at. So like Wired Magazine, for instance. I forget, I have Adblock Plus on. When I try to read an, um, an article, I'll get a little pop-up that's like, hey, you're using an ad blocker. We depend on advertising for our job. Turn your ad blocker off. And you can actually turn the ad blocker on and off on a page by page by page basis. So I can let Wired show me ads because I like to read Wired and I think they should continue to exist. But when I go to, I don't know, Salon, Slate, like some Boing Boing, Boing Boing has too many ads. I love those guys, too many ads. I can keep Adblock Plus Pro. How can I not do this? <laughs> Adblock Plus on, and I won't see them. Now, an interesting thing is, when you install this, by default, one of the settings is allow non-intrusive advertising, which is not a bunch of words that makes intuitive sense. And what it means is, allow Google text ads. So when you install it, if you don't change any settings, It'll allow Google to serve you text ads. And maybe you don't care. Your text yeah, ads. Uh, websites can also uh, go to Adblock Plus and show that they have responsible ad tracking uh, right. and get whitelisted on there. So, so it's not just certain, like non intrusive, like a oh, certain perfect. websites whose advertisers play by the rules, uh, the ads will come through on Adblock Plus. Perfect. Did you guys hear what she said? Basically, there are advertising companies or pages that advertise that can whitelist so that they will be okay, but they play by the rules of the internet, etc. And this is, it'll, you can get it for eh, Firefox, Safari, Chrome. I don't know about Internet Explorer slash Edge, maybe not. But again, installing it is literally two to three clicks, and then it is running. It is a joy. You do need to think, again, how you feel about advertising in a general sense, but one of the things that's been really hard for the people that come to drop in time, a lot of them use Yahoo or AOL for their email, which, okay, great, no judgment, right? But a lot of those sites serve giant, blinky, super obnoxious advertising, you know, like, hey, are you ready for bathing suit weather? And, you know, these 80 year old women are like, I haven't been ready for bathing suit weather <laughs> since 1983. What is going on? Or worse, they don't quite know how the computer works and they're a little bit worried the computer knows they're not ready for bathing suit weather and that makes them feel bad. So if they just don't see that ad, they're happier people. So I like to help them do that piece. I, you know, my opinion on bathing suit weather is that all weather is bathing suit weather if you are wearing a bathing suit, but I know that many places don't feel that way. Many people don't feel that way. And this thing is called Privacy Badger. 
Privacy Badger is a browser plugin. Again, it's a thing you navigate to the website from your browser, click install, click yes. Privacy Badger, that kind of triangular third party cookie thing that I told you about, that my New York Jets bag, which I never did buy because I just got mad and decided not to, that third party cookie thing, it keeps that from happening. It means a web, your browser can only read the cookies from the site that put the cookies there. And the cookie word, it's weird, but I'm using it because it's the word. So if the New York Times sets my font size to be a little bigger for my eyes, the New York Times can read that cookie, but then I don't get ads for glasses on other websites. Mm -hmm. And it's made by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. If this is a topic that is interesting for you, they're kind of online privacy people and write about it in ways that I feel like a lot of people can easily understand. My favorite thing about Privacy Badger, besides how adorable is this badger, is, and you run it and it's just, it's, you know, it'll be up a little picture of the badger up in the corner. And maybe you go to a website and it's supposed to have a movie playing and nothing's playing and you're like, what's going on? And you're like, I think it's because the movie comes from a different website and maybe Privacy Badger broke it. And you can actually tell Privacy Badger, again, by clicking, Privacy Badger broke this website, and it will learn, and it will turn itself off for the thing that you're trying to do so that you don't wind up with a bunch of broken internet because you're using too many privacy tools and you break things for yourself. I think one of the things a lot of people worry about is that they're going to make so many affirmative decisions they are going to make this complicated for themselves and then they're going to be unable to use the thing, right? Like, I don't know if you've ever made a password so complicated you couldn't remember it, but boy, I do it all the time, and mercifully I can still get into my email so that I can reset my password, et cetera, et cetera. But that's tough, right? So all of these tools are not only useful tools, but they're also user serviceable in ways that people who are not that tech savvy can get around, can click on things, can learn things, et cetera. All of these things come thumbs up recommended for me, and uh, they work fairly straightforwardly, which is nice. And so last sort of aspect of privacy is just kind of the reality check. And I use this example, even though Google, who never fixes anything, fixed this example. So it used to be you would search Google for Shirley Temple as an example, right? And Google does this thing where it really tries to kind of serve something up over on the side. You know, like you search for a person's name. A lot of times you'll see a picture of that person, maybe some information on the side. A lot of times that comes in from Wikipedia, right? So you search for Shirley Temple, and you get like this weird, confusing combination of things, right? Like, these are all pictures of Shirley Temple. That's not really her name. That is definitely her job. That's her job. That's not when she was born. I don't know if that's when she died. That's her name. I think those are her kids. That's who she was married to. And so basically they've taken two people, Sir Richard Temple and Shirley Temple, and somehow combined them together. And the, the worst part about this entire thing is if you look at these born and died dates, <laughs> this person was <laughs> what? like. Yeah, hundreds of years old, a hundred and some odd years old. And so you can use your human eyeballs and be like, that's not real, right? I, I hesitate to use the kind of fake news moniker because the current administration has ruined that. But the idea that like, this just isn't real. Like it's being given to us as authoritative and it is very much not, and a child could determine this, but a computer, somehow can't or doesn't or doesn't care. And so a lot of what I tell people as the last step in the privacy stuff is think to yourself, well, where does that come from? Like this is Google trying to be helpful by mushing some stuff together and it turns out this is not actually correct. And so some of the advice that privacy people will give you, like you get some random email from somebody you haven't heard from in years and years and years and it's just one link to a website that you've never heard of, eh, maybe not clicking on that is a good idea. Or like dropping your friend an email and be like, did you send me some random link? Because one of the things about interacting with a lot of sort of email novices 
is they use email in unpredictable ways, right? So maybe they did that, but you can always reality check with them and make sure. This is true for a lot of different scams too, right? Like, oh, I'm stuck in France and I need, you know, a hundred bucks in order to get home. Like, she's never been on an airplane before. <laughs> I bet she's not stuck in France. And so using your human eyeballs and your human brain, and maybe you call your friend. You're home, not stuck in France? Good, I will not send you any money, etc. And so don't call numbers you see in pop-ups. This actually happens with alarming regularity in my drop-in time. Somebody will be sitting at home, they're doing a thing. In fact, this one woman, she was having trouble with her Netflix, right? So she Googles, repair Netflix. And unfortunately, that is a thing that lots of scam artists have determined that people do in order to fix a thing maybe using kind of the wrong pathway. And so she just scanned the list of results for the first thing that had a phone number, called that phone number, and talked to a very nice person who then told her that she had to install these things on her computer to get Netflix working. And so it's a weird thing to say, but I always tell people, anytime you get a pop-up on your computer that says, you're in trouble, call this number, even if it seems like it's saying very menacing things that sound scary, that never actually happens. Like in the real world, you will never get a pop-up with a phone number that you have to call in order to solve a computer problem. Like you may get a text from your annoying friend that says call me with a phone number. Again, because people use the computer in weird ways. But not your computer is broken, call us. One of the other things I talk about a lot is if you mouse over a link, like you get a link in email, let's say, and it looks like it's going to your bank, but then you kind of wave your mouse over it and you can see sometimes in the status line, sometimes there's a pop-up, the web address that it's actually going to, so you may have like a, a link in email that's like bankofamerica.com slash you're in big trouble. And you're like, whoa, I should definitely click on that. That goes to bankofamerica.com. But a link, the text of a link can be anything. And if you hover your mouse over it, or if you're on a phone, you can kind of tap hold and it'll show you what the actual web address is and you can see if that's going where it's supposed to. And so figuring out how to see where a link goes. And my favorite thing about this is I used it as an example a lot, telling people, well, privacy, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't include it in this picture, but there's a link that you can click if you see something like that come up and you're like, that's actually not correct, like that's wrong. And Google did actually eventually fix it. And then for a while there was this great thing where if you Googled the word hamster, they'd show you a picture of a guinea pig because they were scraping pictures from pets.com small pets page and the guinea pig was the first image on the page that included hamsters and they fixed that too. So one of the things that I think is super important and it's weird to think about when you see something that's busted report it even if it feels like it's going nowhere and again privacy people a lot of times are like there's nothing you can do I don't necessarily have that same feeling. I feel like there are things you can do. They don't always result in the results you want. They don't always result in the results quickly enough. They don't always result in sort of the outcome you were hoping for. But the only way these dumb robots learn anything is by humans with their real human eyeballs basically telling them, hey, people don't live to be 180 years old. I'm a human, I know this. And if you're interested in testing your own knowledge, there's a, kind of a nice quiz online. It's 10 questions. A lot of the stuff is stuff I went over today um, by a Pew, who's kind of an independent uh, research think tank. But you know, if you're sort of curious, how much do you know about cybersecurity? There's not only a little quiz, it's 10 questions, it's pretty easy, but it'll tell you how you did relative to other people, again, it's totally fine, whatever your level of anything is, but it can actually give you an idea about whether how you're doing already is okay. Because I think a lot of people feel like they don't know anything and everything's impossible, but it may actually be that compared to the average person, you're doing pretty good. Or if you're not, well, you know what you can work on. And sometimes it helps to set sort of normative ideas about where your own stuff is. Because I think a lot of us feel like we don't know stuff or we don't know who to listen to. Realistically, if your solutions are mostly working for you, then you are mostly fine. And 
Lastly, my plug for, if you're not sure, the nice people at the library. This is my beautiful library with the tree that's no longer there. The nice people at the library can often, if not help you directly, point to people who can, and then we all get a little bit smarter. So thanks very much. mentioned at the very beginning is librarian.net slash talks t-a-l-k-s slash privacy 17 so a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about there's a Google document because I still use Google because life's too short um, there's a Google other page hold on There's these slides, but also links to all the stuff that I was talking about. Here's more information about Tor. Here's what's a VPN. Here's how to stop your smart TV from spying on you. Here's Adblock, Privacy Badger, how to opt out of ads on Google. The quiz I talked about. And a couple things if you're really interested in this and want to read more about this stuff on a regular basis, there's stuff that you can do. So do people have questions? I know it's a lot of talky-talky information. Hey, Howard. Howard, right. um, Shane, is there a abuse place for all the different? I know on Comcast, abuse at Comcast, but it's hard to find. Do you so, just forward the message to? Yeah, so Howard's question was about phishing. Phishing with a PH. <clears throat> that is when somebody sends you a message usually, and they're trying to make you believe that that message comes from somebody authoritative, like your bank, or you know your doctor, or whatever, and they're like, click this link. Or especially, they'll email you and be like, we got to fix this problem right now. Respond in this form with your username and password so we can fix your things. First of all, never send a password over email. Um, second of all, do a reality check on what you get. I get a lot of email that claims to be, I, I don't get a lot, but I have gotten email that's like, hey, it's Bank of America, there's some serious trouble with your bank. And I'm like, my bank is Northfield Savings Bank, so. <laughs> and they just do like law of averages, trying to like get as many people as possible. Depending on your email provider, Gmail does a really good job. Again, I use the Googles for a lot of things. Gmail does a really good job kind of blocking a whole bunch of spam, like people that are kind of trying to mess with you in that way. Um, they also, you can report spam. Yahoo has the same thing. I don't know about the other web-based providers, but marking something as spam not only gets it out of your inbox, but it makes the machine slowly learn in order to um, get less of that next time. One of the pieces of advice that I give people in general is that Internet service providers are competent at delivering, delivering internet to your house. They're terrible, generally speaking, as email providers. Like their tools aren't very good. Um, they don't care about email, basically. They provide it because a lot of people wouldn't really know how to necessarily get email if they weren't using their email from their internet service provider. But if you have internet service provider provided email, you might want to filter it either through something like Gmail or something like Yahoo, or there's a whole bunch of actually more private companies that are not Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, or AOL. They sometimes cost a little bit of money, as opposed to like Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, AOL, which are free. But every time you're getting a free service from the internet, at some level, you're the product that is being sold is sort of a lot of times what we say. So sometimes I tell people filter it through a web-based uh, mail provider because they'll, they've will they got more effective spam filtering. But also, you know, you can report it to your um, internet service provider, but one of the problems is a lot of the people that are perpetuating phishing scams aren't even in this country, which means that the laws that affect what they're doing only sort of are actionable in the United States, if that makes sense. So, you know, phishing is its own problem, but reality checking in the same way, like, I don't 
think my bank would. Like, if you get an email that says it's from your, well, here's my funny joke, right? Northfield Savings Bank is my bank, and they are fine. They're a little local bank. One of the things they allow me to do is through my web-based banking, I can put a security phrase in so that every time I receive an email from Northfield, it has that security phrase in the subject line of the email from them. Which means anytime I get an email from Northfield, if it doesn't have, we are from your bank, we are not screwing around in the subject line, which is the thing I typed in because that's my sense of humor, I know that it's not actually from my bank. And so your bank may have a similar security setting that's buried somewhere in the jumble of web email settings, but it would be worth looking at because then you can feel more secure. Like, is this really my bank? It mostly happens with banking, PayPal, Facebook, um, and you know the web-based providers like Gmail, Yahoo, whatever. Yeah? Uh, you know, Justin, I like to tell people that if you get something from your bank that's saying there's a problem, don't click on anything in that email message, but go and log into your bank the way you normally do with like a bookmark that you've got saved anyway. Exactly. Because if they cared about it enough to send you email, when you log in, there should be some kind of notice that comes up then. Right. Or call them. Or call them on the phone. Call them. Yeah, well, like whether it's your bank or your credit card. Or uh, Apple ID scam, and you can just go call Apple, and they would much rather like help you yes. and tell you it's like a fake one than have you click something bad. They're very yeah. patient. If you're you you're never them, bugging the people calling them on the phone. You may have to waste a little bit of time, and that's slightly irritating. But always, you know, trust, but verify. Hey, this is Jessamine, because I have gotten like stupid email from my other bank sometimes. Not that's asking for my password, but that is giving me information I would not be expecting my bank to give. Just because different businesses have different levels of understanding of how to communicate. I mean, I don't know if any of you like got healthcare through the exchange, but like Vermont Health Connect was the absolute worst in terms of communicating in ways that seemed totally scammy, but were actually completely legitimate. But it is worth remembering that like anybody can use a Bank of America logo in an email, for instance. So the logo doesn't necessarily mean you're secure. Anybody can use like a footer that says this is really the bank. But having like your secure passphrase or you calling them up or you going to a website not through their link in the email but going through your own bookmark can confirm it's mostly banks, health insurance, Facebook, and sort of web-based email stuff, I've found. Okay. I don't know, I've been getting uh, a lot of terms of service renewals over the last uh, mm -hmm. week, and I finally figured out what was going on. It's the, uh, all the major companies who have operations in, in Europe, EU, they passed this general data protection regulation mm -hmm. so that they actually have to, they have to comply with the law there but because they operate here, they actually have to send those uh, new terms of service mm -hmm. to us as well. Because I don't know, I was getting like every day in my inbox. Yeah, no, that that is a has been nuts this last like couple weeks. If you've been getting lots of email from like basically every big web company you might have an account with, hey, we've updated our terms of service. Hey, we've updated our terms of service. Hey, we've updated our terms of service. It's because the EU has new data protection laws, and if you're an international company, you just update your terms of service for everyone. Their data protection laws aren't necessarily going to make your stuff any more secure, but potentially they could if they just decided, ah, oh, we'll make stuff more secure for everybody. I mean, one of the things that I find interesting in that regard is like, you know, I used I use Twitter a lot for communicating. I enjoy it. It's sort of fun to talk about. But one of the problems about Twitter is there's a lot of white nationalist jerks on there who kind of make everything noisy and you can't talk about substantive political stuff around racial issues sometimes without white nationalists being really irritating. And I was like, ah, super irritating. But it turns out, like in Germany, where like Nazis are actually illegal, Twitter actually has a filter that you can use in Germany where you don't see any of those sort of accounts because they actually know who they are. So if you log on to Twitter and you tell Twitter you live in Germany, you don't even need a VPN. You just say, ah, I'm in Germany. Suddenly you can talk about you know, race issues without having white nationalists just get all up in your mentions. 
So it is interesting watching international companies try to navigate the different laws that affect you know, data privacy and security. We're actually lucky living in Vermont. We have slightly more data protections because of the laws of the state in terms of, I'm trying to remember exactly what it is. I think it's mostly like your ability, if you have a problem, to not get forced into arbitration in North Carolina or something. We have slightly more data protections thanks to our sort of state's attorney general office than they do in New Hampshire or they do in Massachusetts or they do in Connecticut. Any other questions? Um, I just, I was listening half from the computer, but did you actually say that uh, the uh, camera in the computers and on TVs, smart TVs? Yeah. They can actually spy on us? Well, they're not supposed to. Like, theoretically, they're built so that there's a little light that should go on anytime the camera goes on, and that's how you know. Realistically speaking, people have hacked Android phones, for example, so that you know if you downloaded kind of a sketchy app from the Android store, it might be able to activate the camera without the light going on. It is definitely the exception and not the rule. But one of the things that's interesting about smart TVs is that theoretically when they're connecting to the internet, they're connecting to their, you know, Samsung is sending their stuff to Samsung. And theoretically, how Samsung connects to your TV and how your TV connects to Samsung is some kind of like password regulated handshake. But that password is just a default password that comes with the TV. And Samsung, as an example, and this happened years ago, and I believe they fixed it, like manufacturers often ship things with default passwords and either they assume you're going to fix it or they assume no one's ever going to figure out what it is. And so one of the things I always tell people to Google with your smart device is, you know, blah, 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 my device, default password to see if maybe, you know, your internet router at home probably has a default password that you could probably change. Your Android phone may, your sketchy apps may, there was a DVD player, I guess, that had like a default password issue. And so theoretically, in general, it could happen. Realistically speaking, we haven't seen a lot of exploits where it actually is happening. But if you're somebody who is specially concerned, you can get like a little stick'em thing to cover up your camera and or your microphone and be more secure that that's not happening. And just staying on top of the news, again, there's a couple like, really good weblogs that talk about sort of security issues. Um, the Deep Links blog is one of them. Like if there was a TV that it had been determined could actually be videotaping you while you sat on your couch and was doing that, security experts are pretty good at getting on top of this and sort of letting you know about it. Because one of the things that is helpful is there's so many people that have these devices and a lot of them are kind of smart techie people. They're curious as the same as you are. And so they're trying to figure it out. There's a great article, I don't think I put it in here, um, this woman who basically decided she's a art writer for Wired, I think? She got every smart device, and then she had a friend of hers come in and listen to her network traffic to actually figure out how much her smart devices, she got a smart bed, she got a smart microwave, <laughs> she got a smart plant waterer, she got a smart whatever to determine how much they actually were phoning home and how much data they were sending back and forth. And it's eye-opening to give you an idea of, like, some of these things are sending just the minimum necessary information. Some of them are just talking every hour, even if nothing's going on, just to let you know what's happening. Like, if you get a Nest, a smart thermostat, part of what the Nest does is it knows when you're walking around and it makes the house a little warmer because you're home. Maybe you don't care, maybe you do care, but in a lot of cases, maybe you don't even know it's doing that. And so you should be able to do that so that you can make your own kind of smart choices about it. And the library's got stick them you can put over your... Yeah, if you're worried about it, we have webcam yeah, covers. We have part they have webcam too. covers and you can take them home with you. And these are not a low-tech thing. No. Like everybody no. from like just members of the US 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 and Mark Zuckerberg uses and them. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's a normal thing. It's not yeah. a low-tech hack. It's just people always 
everyone yeah. has it. Yeah, I think the one I have is from like Massachusetts ACLU. I like it because the Statue of Liberty sta stares right back at me while I'm while I'm looking at it. But like you know, I, again, I sort of mentioned at the beginning, like being absolutely a hundred percent private kind of means just really not using the internet. But once you've decided, okay, I'm gonna you know try some things. I mean, there's a lot of people, for instance, after all this Facebook, Cambridge Analytica stuff, who were like, rah, dump Facebook. And I'm like, I don't know what planet you live on, but I lose touch with 75% of my neighbors who I don't see walking around if I'm not using Facebook at all. Maybe a solution for me is to use Facebook smarter. Watch sort of what I connect to, watch what apps I've authorized, tighten up my password, and maybe delete some old stuff. And that's a more practical price. Maybe solution take it off my phone. Yeah, maybe take it off my phone. Because I did take that, it off my phone. That is actually the biggest thing I, I was waiting to see if you were going to talk about. Because I think one of the biggest privacy things is the Facebook app. It, it, it phones home regularly. It does all kinds of privacy invasive tracking. It both this uh, it's, they've proven that the uh, Facebook has turned on the uh, microphone and listened to to get more relevant ads when you mention something. And then they said it was just a beta. And then like there was this one instance where a therapist saw mostly senior citizens, but she had one young man who was her patient. And you know like there's laws about like you can't talk sure. about or but, and and her that young man in his therapy session complained to his therapist that Facebook continually said under people you wouldn't they know it was all senior citizens. And that's how she, she contacted Facebook and realized that um, Facebook thought it would be funny to, or fun for people to, who like saw each other regularly in the elevator to be able to get suggested and people you may know. But it was because actually suggesting people, they track their location and then suggested people who regularly went to the same location to each other. That's a privacy violation Super in almost every way. Because Facebook, Facebook knows, yeah. if you use it on yeah. your phone, it knows where you are and theoretically has access to your microphone, your camera, and they run a lot of like random beta tests and they really don't care about privacy at all. Yeah. So like I use it at home on my computer, I use an app actually. If you use Facebook on your computer, there's a great kind of ad block plus similar uh, app called um, Facebook Purity, FB Purity, that's literally a browser plugin and you can have it not show you ads on Facebook, your friends invite you to games, you can have it not do that. You can filter out words you don't want to see. If I don't want to be reminded of our current president, I can just filter out his name and I never need to see anybody mentioning him. Or whatever, like whatever your thing is, maybe you just really hate cats. Um, you know, you can filter out, you can filter out I think all pictures of dogs, like it's crazy. But if you really would like to control your experience but still use it, taking it off your phone and as well, um, using browser plugins is a great way to be able to do that. Yeah. Thank you very much.